a light board, and how you can tell is there's a little different arrangement up in here for some of the uh, caps and transistors and stuff to make room for a fuse tucked in over in here. Uh, usually 3 16ths of an amp uh, fast blow. That's for protection for the 190 volts going through the displays. They decided they needed this, so they rearranged this section in the later solenoid drivers just for that purpose. Other than that, they're identical. We'll be working with the early one um, because I needed the extra room in there to be able to put some information. We'll come back to this later on, but what I want to do is point out now what we're going to be doing. This section in here is your high voltage. Here and here. This is a uh, high voltage transistor. You have another one in circuit here, a small one, one with a heat sink cap on it. And so this section right in through here is high voltage. Not this relay, that's for your flippers. Over in here is your 5 volt section with this large cap, which is a filter. There's some more filters over here on the side just before it exits. So we'll come back to this to show you uh, the actual layout of the parts and what they look like and the trouble spots which I've got marked here with some red stickers. Then the other section we'll be doing is touching on these transistors down here at the bottom. So what I've done is taken a regular diagram and blown it up. And now we're going to look at the different sections. This is pretty uh, close to what they have in the, in the book. But I've got it blocked out so much larger so you can see. And hopefully we can uh, read some of this stuff too. Alright, why don't we start with the easiest section, I think. This is your 5 volt section. They've got showing you your 11.9 comes in. I keep showing you that 11.9 coming in off of the power supply board. Well, here's where it comes in. And these two connectors here. Now, we're going to have to take that 11.9 and clean it up to make it 5 volts. But I want to point out something right here that's unique on this particular section. You see where I made a note right here? independent ground return. What that means is even though there are, there are ground terminals on this board, on this solenoid driver board, they've chosen to have a separate pin with a separate wire independent of any other ground on the board to run back to the power supply. It ends up at the same place. They could just as easily have run this ground on over to a trace pad on the side, but they chose to run an independent wire. They did the very same thing for the 5 volt as they do the uh, 190 down here. Again, I made a note, independent ground return. And I'll show you what that actually means and why it's important. On the back of this board, I have marked out here, get it right side up, uh, get the shadows out of there. You see here it says ground for 190 volts. That trace running right across the board is a ground return, a separate wire, a separate pin all its own. Down here, we have a big fat one going on over to the capacitor on the other side, the big capacitor. And that's the ground return for the 5 volts. Again, they narrow it down and it's got its own independent pin, independent of the regular ground which is located right here. If they'd run this down to here and the other one down to here, you wouldn't be having problems later on. I don't know why they didn't, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, they have separate pins. So in effect, if anything happens to that connection, or that wire coming out of here, going back to the regulator board, you will shut the game down completely. You will either shut the, the displays down because you've lost the ground return for this cap here, for the 190, or you'll lose the ground return for the 5 volts filter. Either one of the two will shut down a section completely. And you'll spend all kinds of time testing this board out. Everything, the components are good, transistors are good, you'll go ahead and change this regulator, you'll do all this kind of stuff. When in fact all you needed to do was just put a quick jumper to find out if that's the problem. Right from here on down to a trace inside the cabinet. One of the ground traces that runs along inside the cabinet. Simply ground it right to here. Ground trace which then goes back to the transformer. Then you know that this, this wire either has lost a trace the pin is loose, or the wire running all the way back to the transformer is loose. Maybe the connection back to the transformer is loose. This could happen with early style 
power supplies or late style power supplies. I've had it happen to both of them. The game shuts down, bang, gone. And it's only because of this independent ground return. All right, enough on that. That's why I made a note of it. You'll be getting a copy of this and all the other diagrams that I've drawn up. So I'll just shrink them down a little bit to make them easier to uh, copy. Now, uh, referring to this big cap that we showed you on there, that uh, cap can be substituted in case you don't have one exactly the same. As long as you can physically fit it onto the board, you can substitute any cap of the same or higher rating. How they're rated is what they call microfads, MFD. And this one here is rated at 11,700. Well, anything 11,700 on up is going to be a big cap anyway. So if you find one out of an old video game that happens to be 15,000 or 20,000 or 30,000, fine, put it in there if you can physically find room to mount it on the board. It might hang over here a little bit. But any cap that's rated this or higher will suffice. And what that cap is doing, in effect, is taking this unregulated, bumpy 11.9 that's coming in and it's smoothing it out, sending it on down the line to a 5 volt regulator. Now the problem with these is that these can't be tested, at least I've never found a way to test them in circuit. If I suspect this is bad, I simply take it out and put another one in. I've never found a good test for this 5 volt regulator. It cannot be tested as a diode or as a transistor. It simply is not the same unit. And here I'll list three different numbers that qualify for the same unit. So any one of those three will work fine in the board. They are numbered as far as connections are concerned. One, two, and three. Three is also the case. And if you look at the back of the board, you can see those numbers one, two, and three. If you're doing any kind of testing, that's how you refer to them. We'll move on down the line. Now, assuming that everything is right here, we're now going to come out the other side, and we now have five volts, clean, straight, filtered. They run another filter across here one more time. In the very early games, they changed the rating of this or added another one in because it still had a tiny spike left in it. So if you have a spike problem, you can simply add another cap across here of about the same rating in addition to this one, and it will do the job. Now here's the part that is fairly straightforward and easy. All of these pins right here that are listed all go to other boards for your 5 volts. They distribute it all over the inside of the cabinet. The MPU, the lamp drivers, the uh, displays, anywhere you need 5 volts, they come up here. Now here's something that's kind of unique to this board and it's a little on the stupid side, but they went ahead and did it anyway. Instead of just continuing this 5 volt on up and continue it along the solenoid driver board because you're going to need it to run the chips on there, they put a jumper in here from pin 13 to pin 25. You'll see it sticking out there. It's brown and yellow. Anything happens to that jumper or the pins or the connector, you will shut down the entire coils on the game because this and this chip and this chip and this chip which sort out which transistor to turn on and uh, a bunch of a variety of different things they're doing with these chips all take five volts and they will simply shut down if they don't get the five. Now why they didn't just include it in, a, in, a, in, a, in another uh, trace on the back I will never know but anyway you've got to look for that little loop up here and that little wire loop is the only way the 5 volts can get down. If your game is shut down completely dead as far as oil coils are concerned and the fuses are all good, I think you should start looking to see whether or not you've got a bad wire up here or a bad connection. That's another one of those wire little things that Belly did. I've never been able to figure out why. And here we go along here you'll see several test points 6, 3, 6 and 7 and this is just your bus line, your 5 volt bus line that actually loops back up through and feeds all of those chips I just showed you. That's what they're indicating with this right here. So the 5 volt section is pretty straightforward. You're going to measure your 11.9 at test point 5, use a ground strap on the inside of the game for uh, your ground return for your meter. Go over here it should read 11.9 or somewhere near. If it doesn't you've got, to, you've got to find out why. It could possibly be this cap pulling it down, a bad cap, 
uh, you should have a nice 5 volts over here. Now the only way you're going to know what you've got is with a meter. But the meter is only going to tell you quantity, not quality. If you've got any question about what this 5 volts looks like it's coming out of here because the game is acting strange or not starting or going off or whatever, then you're going to have to use an oscilloscope, which is not something that common. But if you uh, happen to have access to someone that has one, then he can hook up his oscilloscope uh, on this. If it's uh, fired up, we've showed you before how to fire this board up with just a uh, transformer. Then he can put his oscilloscope across here and ground and take a look at this 5 volts, and it should be clean and flat and straight. Then you can see if there's any AC ripple mixed in with it which would uh, tell you you've got some AC coming in on it, or whether or not the 5 volt DC has got little waves in it. It should be pretty straight and pretty flat coming out of here to run everything the way it's supposed to. All right, that's the 5 volt section. Fairly easy to troubleshoot, fairly straightforward. On the other hand, you've got this incredibly complex unit down here, which was Bally's way of doing the 190 volt regulator. This is far more complicated to troubleshoot but it almost always comes down to the same components which go. And I'll show you what that means. If you've got a bad cap here, this big capacitor, I'll show you what that is again on the board. That's that fairly good size one up here. You never want to go poking around with this thing, by the way. This thing will have 200 plus volts on it. If you're playing around inside there, you can really get zapped. If this goes bad, and they frequently do, you, first of all, might get a hum out of the, uh, out of the audio uh, section if you happen to have a, a game with uh, a soundboard. Because this will raise all kinds of hell with the displays if it starts to go bad, and it'll put all kinds of noise on the line. So will this one, too, for that matter. But if this cap is shorted to ground, it'll simply blow the fuse uh, long before it ever gets down to this section. It'll blow the fuse back on the uh, transformer for the incoming voltage and it'll simply take it right to ground immediately. And that happens. Any capacitor can wear out after a while. They usually have an age factor to them anyway. Okay, so we come in here with approximately 230 volts, as you see what I've got written right here. 230 plus or minus 27. They say this because if it's 200, you aren't supposed to go looking for problems back here. It could be somewhere between 200 and 230 plus or minus. It could be 250. So it's acceptable to be in that range. That's why they add this plus or minus figure underneath here to keep you from running around and getting nervous because now it isn't exactly what you thought it was going to be. Again, I made a note down here about the independent return for this, which I showed you before. But very simply, I'm not going to go into the detail of how they get this thing to work. I'm not so sure I understand myself. But what I've done is I've put an asterisk here on the most common places that you'll have a problem. If either one of these two transistors, they're both the same number, go, then the very next thing to go is this 22K half watt resistor. That'll t burn that right out and probably the board underneath it while you're at it. Now you've gone out of regulation and this Q21, which is the big transistor on there on the heatsink, will go also. And to cure this problem, there is no way around it. You can test out to see if these things are gone. If any one of them is gone, don't just replace that one piece. I guarantee you turn it back on and this one will be gone or this one will be gone shortly thereafter. You've got to replace one, two, three transistors and at least one resistor. Every time you work on this circuit, it's almost standard practice. You just simply can't take a chance. Even if I test these out and I find them to be okay, I'm not going to take a chance on them. I'll put a fresh one in here and here and here just to be sure that I start with fresh three components when I'm starting out. If you end up with a weak transistor down here that's been weakened by a power surge running through it or heating up, then you're going to end up with a, doing the same damn thing all over again. So expect to change this resistor, one, two of these transistors, and other, which are the same, and this one up here. Now another point I'll cross here, this is a Zener or Zener, I'm never sure what it is, diode. And the reason why this is in circuit this goes on over to your adjustment to set the voltage that ends up at the lamps. I prefer to have it around 175. They say 180 to 190. I like it around 175. Makes the lamps run a little cooler and then no dimmer than they were before. Now, if you cannot get any adjustment out of this pot, you can suspect the pot, but more than likely, if it stays at 230, which is the input, the output's the same, this has gone out of regulation in through here, and you can adjust this pot all day long, and it won't make any difference. 
I come across a problem once where it wouldn't go up over 100. And it wasn't the pot, it was this xenodiode down here. This actually is a regulator of sorts, and it takes 190 and runs and lets it go 140 across this junction, so you end up with 140 volts on this. You should test this at 140 volts on this side. Should test for 140 plus or minus 14. If not, you can suspect this. If, if you got the high voltage on this side and not the 140 on the other side, you can suspect this unit is being bad. Sometimes this wiper will go bad in this thing here and there's only one spot it wants to work and it, and it won't work at the 175, 180 set and only work at 195 because it's burnt one of the windings in there. It's not a very expensive unit, so it's easy to replace. Uh, Radio Shack doesn't have them, but uh, Wyco does. All right, so the main suspect here is these three transistors, which work in unison, one, one with the other. And a, and a sign that they're gone bad is just to take a look at this 22K. If it, if it had enough time, it will cook and burn right up to a crisp. And then you're pretty sure you're going to have to do these three. Now, I regulate mine by putting my volt ohm meter in the farthest display away from this unit, which is player four and I simply put it in the connector on the red wire coming in at player, on the uh, player 4 display from there to ground and I adjust my voltage there. That's as far away as you can get from this unit and if I put it at 175 there it'll be 178 on one of the other displays 180 back. It drops a little bit going through the line but I use the last one as a, uh, as a uh, measurement. Now how you can tell this thing has gone out of circulation very simple you'll see the display is suddenly very bright or maybe some of the digits missing because it's popping transistors on the back of the display and uh, if it's got the full 230 volts on it, it'll still light the displays up. They'll just be tremendously bright and they'll start shorting out and arcing between uh, digits in the displays. So you've got to go up there and test your voltage and see what it is. If it's 230 and this unit down here on the board, I'll show you what that actually looks like, if it will no longer regulate then you've got to run away high voltage there's your adjustment right there. You take a plastic uh, screwdriver, uh, at least that's what I use, and I go in there and I just tweak that back and you should watch that voltage drop down on the meter. If it stays at 230 on the meter and this thing doesn't do any good, shut the game down and go ahead and replace this one here, this one here, and whoops, where am I? Over here. I got the wrong one. Here we go. This one here and this one and this one and your R51, which is this resistor right there, that big fat resistor is the one that fries. Almost always, invariably, those three will go. At least I found it a safe practice to change all three. You might save yourself a couple of dollars by not doing it that way, but I think you kind of wish you did. Okay, this I've shown over here where some of them have a th uh, 3 16 fuse and some not. There was only one connection coming out of here. There's no ground return because the ground return is on the displays, goes back through their, its own wiring harness, back to the uh, um, power supply board. It's only on the input that you have the special wire running back. This was kind of confusing when I first ran across this because it didn't make any sense. A ground is a ground is a ground, but they didn't pick up any traces on here and then I found out they have an independent wire running back on both of these. And that's uh, caused some problems until I finally got used to it. Okay, let's go to the transistors. What we're talking about here are a bunch of different transistors that are right on this board right here. First, we're going to talk about these One's on the bottom. These are your power transistors for turning on the coils. A transistor is nothing more than a switch. If you think of it as a switch, whether it be a high-speed switch turning off and on all the time, or these, a power switch, you're simply taking the ground side of a coil through this transistor on into ground if it gets the proper signal to turn on. Where you run into the problem with these is they turn on, sometimes a coil will stick for whatever reason and fry, and this almost always gets cooked too. There is no test for these transistors, and I'll show you why. At least I've never discovered one. They're called a Darlington transistor. Here's the diagram of it right here. I've written down the most common number. All right, here we go. SC9302. I've listed uh, different numbers from different uh, companies. You've got several different ones you can use on this board. As you can see, we don't have one transistor. We have one behind another one. This is uh, so they can use a small amount of voltage to control a large amount of current. Here in the center, tying the two of them together, amongst uh, some other resistors and stuff, you'll see a diode right in the middle. 
That's why you can't test this thing out as a regular transistor. At least I've never been able to because you get a false reading. You get a phony reading or no reading at all. The reason being is you're working with two transistors and you aren't really working with the junctions that, uh, that you normally work with. So this Darlington configuration, which is only used on pinball games for coils, cannot be tested with a regular meter. But I got a shortcut test that I use. If I suspect one of these is bad, I'll hook up the ground loop over here with an ohm meter and simply run my tabs on. The game's not even on now. I'll just simply run down the line on this collector tab on the top. This tab, this metal tab on the top is also collect, uh, connected to the collector side of the same transistor. And I will simply run down the line. If I hear that beeper go off on my uh, continuity check, assuming you've got a beeper on yours or, or watch the ohm meter move, if it moves, you should have infinity on all of these. There's no reason why this should be tied to ground because it isn't turned on. But if it's stuck on because it's frozen or blown, then you'll see that meter move. Then I'll simply make a mark in front of this one. I know damn well that one's bad, and I'll go down the line. But before I just throw another fresh one in, I'll find out what this drove. This might drive a slingshot. I'll go look in the game, and sure enough, the slingshot mechanism will be frozen because it's stuck down inside of a coil, which is sat there and cooked. Even though the paper isn't burnt on it, the coil is cooked and the coil is bad. So you change the coil before you investigate and see if it is the coil. Before you just simply throw another one of these and turn the game back on, you'll just fry the next one that you put in there. So you're just going to repeat the problem. Now, these collector tabs come in handy for continuity check. What I mean by that is you can put your ground lead of your jumper on the strap on the inside of the game and you can go to, or this one here, if the thing is bolted in properly, this ground is the same as the cabinet. If it's bolted in over here in the corner, where am I? If you've got a screw in here in the corner, that completes the circuit, so this ground is the same as the cabinet. So you can put your jumper up on here. Go on over and touch the top of each one of these. Just touch it. The game is on. It's not, it's not uh, in test or anything. It's, it's game is on, but it's not in play mode. It's just in a track mode. You'll hear a coil pull in if there is a coil attached to each one of these. This is after you've done your quick check to see if any of them are bad. This, and then that will tell you that you've got continuity between that collector tab on over to either this connector here, which goes back to the play field, or this connector down here. They sometimes share the same connector, the same transistor. So this connector here and this connector here, and sometimes one or two are up in here, all are connected to transistors. If you hear that coil pull in and you look in your book and sure enough there is one connected to this, some, you might not hear anything pull in. Look in the book to see if they're, they're even using this transistor. They don't always use every single one of them. Then you know that the circuit is complete from here, the trace across here, and the wiring back to the coil. It doesn't tell you whether this is good or not, but it will tell you that the circuit is complete. Now the only way that you can tell is put it in coil test, the solenoid test that's built into the game. Then it'll pull in each one at a time. If you don't hear an accompanying noise of a coil pulling in, whether it be a chime or a knocker or whatever, double check in the book to see if there's anything attached to that one and then find out why that one didn't pull in. If it doesn't pull in in the test, uh, chances are it is a bad uh, transistor. It could be open also. That test that I told you before only is good if you've got a fried transistor. If you've got an open transistor which doesn't make contact from one side to the other after it's turned on by this chip here, then you've got an entirely different problem. And that's why you need the test I told you about for shorts and the game test for opens. Shorts for ground and then the opens in the game test itself when it pulses each one of these. Now, they don't pulse every one of them. They only pulse the ones they use because it's written into the program. Now, you can also, in an emergency, borrow one of these transistors from another position on here. If you can't get one and you want to get the game running and you don't have a chance to, don't want to send away for it right away or whatever, you can look in the book and you'll find that almost always, in the early games especially, they never used every single one of these. So find one that they aren't using. It'll say no connection, no application on the chart. And you're going to remove that one with a solder sucker and take it out and take the bad one out and put the good one in down the line and just leave that thing empty. Not going to do any harm at all. Now here I showed you before the problem areas. And I'm going to go over it one more time that I've listed. We have a Q21 transistor here, Q22, that R51, the adjustment, the cap, and the other transistor here.
Okay, we've covered that section enough. Let's move on. Now we're going to talk a little more about transistors. We've already discussed why we can't check this one out with a VOM because of the fact it's two transistors, one behind the other. Here I've listed a few of the ones that I was able to use from time to time as a substitute for the one that came in the game. They worked fine. There's also a GE one, but I didn't couldn't find the number on it. It wasn't in the in the it wasn't written on it or it wasn't legible, whatever. But I, there was probably even more if you wanted to look it up in the book that had the same rating as this particular one. So you don't necessarily have to use just this one. Now down here is a symbol for a smaller transistor. The, the case is smaller. This is basically the same transistor to the transistor, except the leads on this one here are little tiny fine wires, and it's a half moon shaped device. This is a top view of it, and this is how they're designated. Base, emitter, collector. Here you have base, collector, emitter. You have to know where the pins are. You simply can't judge, you can't assume that the middle one is always going to be the base and do your test that way. There are two different kinds of transistors, NPN and PNP. These up here, this is a listing of some of the ones that are in a Bally game. The MPU has an NPN and a PNP used on there. Display drivers have a PNP and an NPN, depending on how the circuit is designed. All you would do in testing these out is you test this just like a diode. You put your red or black lead on here and check whether or not there's any voltage drop across the junction in either direction. Then you can check across from emitter to a collector. You should get no reading at all if the transistor is working properly. You, you sometimes will use a red lead on here and sometimes a black lead, depending on whether it's an NPN or a PNP. Experiment around with them. Get some cheap ones from Radio Shack and set them up and get familiar with it. Then you'll know exactly how to do it. And yes, you can test some of them in circuit. I've gone ahead and drawn out, because of the complexity of this high voltage circuit here, I've gone and drawn out down here testing of the um, high voltage regulator and the two of the smaller transistors that are used. You have one of these in there, circuit, which is an NPN, and two of these, which are NPNs. Now looking at the bottom of them, as if you were looking up through the PC board from the back, you have a collector, emitter, and base. With the red lead here, you can run your other lead over to here, and then over to here, you should get around a half a volt reading, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, somewhere in that area. Reverse the leads, you should get infinity in these, in these two. That tells you that the junction is good. Now, very simply, you, you're going to do this just to, just to determine. I've already advised you to go ahead and change all these things anyway. But just to determine that uh, these are bad. You can do them right in circuit. There's your base for one of your connections. This one is marked emitter and collector. They're marked right here on the back. So they're facing the same way as my diagram to keep the confusion down. Here you have the base this way. See, this transistor is facing this way. So there's the base emitter and collector. On the large one, you have base, emitter, and the case itself, which that screw goes through, is the collector. I want to remind you of that. Now that means that that's the high voltage outlet of that particular transistor. If you touch that right there and you're leaning up against the cabinet, there's 190 volts in there. Okay, a little caution advised. This whole section is, is a little tough uh, to, to troubleshoot uh, with it live. I don't advise it. I advise you to shut it down, take this board out, do all of your checks, write all of the findings down on a piece of paper, and get some kind of an idea what you're doing. If any one of these three are bad, that shuts that circuit down. And don't take a chance on replacing this without going for a new one of this and a new one of this. Just assume they're all bad. And also physically look at your uh, resistors. You can run an ohmmeter across them to see if they are what they're supposed to be, what the book calls for. That uh, VR1 that I told you about, that uh, Zener diode, is that bl little black number right in there. That's kind of hard to find. I find that uh, only Wyco has it in their book or a dealer. It's not something I've ever found at Radio Shack or of, a, of any kind. You've got to be careful if you're going to do any testing up in here. This is awful close to other components that aren't related to it. And if you aren't really careful with your test leads, you can short this thing out and it could be a fine unit before you get in there with your test leads and there'll be nothing left of it. So I think we pretty well covered everything about this. Um, it's, it's nothing to be afraid of as long as you do most of your testing with the power off. You can't get hurt and you can't hurt any components. And you can find out everything you need to know with the power off. There is uh, no reason to have it on. 
So, uh, with this diagram here, and with uh, the uh, book that came with the game, which gives you some additional troubleshooting problems, I merely uh, explained the most common ones that I've come across. I think you'll find that this unit right here is going to be pretty easy to troubleshoot in the future. Now let's move on to something else. All right, this should wrap it up now on the electronics on this. I think we've covered just about everything except the displays. And uh, they're actually pretty straightforward units to, uh, to check out. It doesn't hurt to have a few extra ones around so you can get to keep the game running and looking good and just uh, you know work on one of these in your spare time. What I've done is, is powered these up using uh, that uh, regulator and uh, solenoid driver and getting a separate circuit just to power up these displays so I can test them out but you really don't have to be that elaborate. You can go ahead and do a lot of the testing on these out of the game cold with just a good VOM to check out all the transistors and resistors. That's what happens to them. A transistor lets go, a resistor lets go, shuts down either a digit, you get one here, either shuts down the entire digit or maybe a segment. Now, if you look at the chart I got here, this is out of a Stern's book, but they're telling you that if digit six, the hundred thousandths, is controlled by a level shifter and a digit driver, a collector, resistor, and a base resistor, in there they'll in the chart on the inside it says uh, if you have a segment out you'll look for a certain part if you have the whole digit out you'll check the resistor first and then the uh, the connected uh, transistor to that it's really straightforward and when you physically look at this you'll see that there are some transistors in there quite a few of them I'm going to get this nice and neat and when you find out which one is associated with that particular digit, let's just say for instance that we got the hundred thousands out here. All right. If you look in the book, you'll see that Q12 is involved, and the uh, resistor number here is uh, R11. Then you have level shifter transistor down below and the book that comes with the game is really very good for this it's a very simple test what you're going to do is find out which one you suspect as being at fault we're over here on the hundred thousands and you're simply going to take a screwdriver and put it in between these two leads and just turn it so it makes contact with both leads if it turns on the display that is blank or turns on the segment that is missing then that needs to be replaced and the accompanying resistor should you should look at them and see whether or not they're good I ohm out every single one of these every time I work on this I go down the line and they're color coded you can tell which belong where and I just go down the line when I find one that's out of rating I just change it because if it isn't gone now it will be very shortly but it usually these transistors that go and I save a bunch of these for parts what I do is I scalp them out. Here's one here. I've got marked good but molted. Now, I don't know if you can detect that, but molted means that there's little tiny spaces in the lens and it's kind of broken up looking when it lights up. That's an age factor and there's nothing to be done about it except replacing the entire glass lens. And I will go ahead and rob all of my transistors out of here and, res and the resistors I, I put fresh ones in. You aren't going to gain anything by, by pulling one of these out if it's already worn anyway. Transistors usually work or don't work is a factor with these transistors. But let me explain something else before you get into all of that and go checking stuff out. Here's where you really got to do your work at first. This is the biggest problem with this. When you go to put this connector on, you push it down on in the game Right? You don't put your fingers underneath here because it might be live, so you push the connector down. What you're doing is you're bending this board, as you can see there. Every time you put that connector on, you're bending that board. And you're breaking the connection, 
the solder connects on each one of these. I put these underneath the magnifying glass when I go to resolder them because sometimes it's a very tiny crack and it's deceptive. And I simply go down the line and resolder all of these. Then I try the lens back in the game before I go troubleshooting anything else. And nine times out of ten I'll solve half the problems with this display right here on this edge connector. Because it simply isn't getting the information or if it doesn't light up it's not getting the power or some of the displays are out or, or, or flashing off and on like they're uh, skipping and that's where a lot of the problems are. I'll do that to this game, the project game that we're working on and it's got a lot of problems, I've seen them but I think I'll probably solve half of them just by resoldering these along here. So, also what I want to touch on here is, uh, we'll get set up and i come back in a minute I want to run through real quick like what it takes to change one of these displays in here. If you've got a perfectly good board and it's working fine and all six digits are lit and working okay except they're molted, they're broken up, they look lousy, some are bright, some are dim, they're arcing in between, they're arcing along the edge here, then it's worth it to find a display. They usually have them on sale, Wyco does every once in a while, for anywhere from well, nine dollars to twelve bucks to save this because there's no sense in throwing this thing away if all it needs is another display. So let me get set up here in just a second or two and I will show you a couple of tricks on uh, putting one of those in. Alright, we're back here with this display. I just suppose we we're going to put a new glass lens in this one here. Most of the ones I've been getting lately uh, come with a sealed back. They don't have that little bubble on there where they drew the air out. And they come with much longer leads on them, which is fine. You don't need all of this, but you've got a bit of a job to try to take this thing apart. What you've got is this bottom plastic that has to be put on that piece right there, the top half comes off separate. The bottom piece has to be slid up over this lens before you attempt to put it in the chassis here. So now you got the plastic piece slid up over here and you got these unbelievable long leads, some of which you aren't even going to use, they're going to be cut off and after they're inserted. And trying to put that down in there and it's awful hard to do. So what I do is, is I'll take a pair of tin snips and go from the shortest possible length that it can be, we'll say it's about roughly yeah, three quarters of an inch and I'll cut those right across at an angle like this until I come out almost full length. Then when I go to insert it, I'll start it in at an angle and then gradually straighten it out and it gets much easier because you're only dealing with one lead at a time that way instead of dealing with 20 of them that you're trying to straighten out and put in at the same time. Doing it the other way, I'll straighten each lead out as it comes to the hole and catch it in there and finally rotate it down in. Not a big deal, but I found it goes a lot faster that way. These displays have got so much life in them and then they're gone. But if the board has never been burnt through from excessive heat or a chip gone bad or something, the resistor heated up and gone through, and the board is still good and there was absolutely nothing wrong with putting a fresh display in here and bringing them all back to life. They last surprisingly long if you keep the voltage down. You can see this one here has that tube I was talking about. That's how they draw the air out of it, seal it. The newer ones aren't coming that way. They're more expensive now than they were before. These were a tiny bit cheaper. But the displays seem to be made a little better and they seem to last longer so uh, it's their uh, they're just a little kind of an expensive item. But every once in a while you'll see them on sale. If you buy five or six of them, they'll discount them off to you. Okay, let's see if we can um, set up now. What we're going to do is, I think we've just about covered the ground on uh, the electronics on the game. Now what we're going to do now, in the next section, is go back to work on the game itself. And I'm going to do little projects I'll uh, line them up in a, in, a, in a little while with a list of what we're going to do and then I'm just going to show you the completed project and anything special that we did to accomplish it because we have still got some more time later on to cover on the Williams board system. We've covered on basic electronic parts quite a bit so we don't need to review that again when we come to Williams. What we're going to do with the Williams is, is we're going to 
just cover their board systems and the different problems that they have with them. So let's get uh, back to working on that game and we'll get something going on that. Right, we're just taking a break here now and getting set up for the rest of it. What we're going to touch on in the next section, we're going to extensively do a rebuild on the flippers. Let you know a lot of the tricks we learned over the years and some of the shortcuts and some of the uh, updates you can do on those. Then we're going to uh, strip out the play field and make up a, a Mylar template and a Mylar itself. And then uh, install that. And then we're going to get in a little uh, gameplay too while we're at it. And move on to covering a Williams board system later on in the uh, next section. We've got about an hour and a half left on this tape and we hope to be able to fit all of that in with no problem. I think we can. We're also going to uh, critique uh, Williams games as we did the Bally games earlier with the brochures. I think you'll find that interesting. Now I guess we'll uh, get started shortly on the uh, in this next section. Well, we've done quite a bit of work on this since the last time, so let's get caught up. What we're going to do in this session is show you uh, how we make up templates for Mylars. Uh, Mylars are a little controversial. Some people don't think they should be on a play field. Other people think they're a necessity. Well, I happen to think they, they uh, cure more uh, ills than they create, so I'm in favor of them. Now, what I've done here is made up a couple of templates. This is not what's considered a full mylar. A full mylar would be on a brand new old stock play field where you could get everything stripped down and you'd make a one piece mylar that went underneath everything. There would be no post or anything on there but everything would be cut around. Be sculpted wherever the ball rolled. That's where they put the mylar. This is as good as we can do on a play field that's pretty much um, all together. We cut a bottom section down here using just, uh, this is drawing paper, it's fairly thick so it'll hold nice and flat when you use it for a template. Made another section up here on top that fits around the existing mylars. And we've gone ahead and done some touching up in this area up here where it was kind of rough. Come out pretty good, show you what we do there. We just get one of these um, art marker catalogs here, this is a color chart. And we come as close as we possibly can to the colors that are on there using this chart. These are all available for a couple of dollars a piece. We built up quite a collection of them. And uh, each time we go down, we might have to get one or two more colors on either side of the red that we already have. And uh, with this chart, you can cover an awful lot of the games. Uh, there's only one way better to do a, a matchup, and that's what a spectrograph it's called. You would take this paint chip. This is off of a play field. We can get that in focus here. And uh, this happens to be off of a Xenon, and we're going to take this down to a local building supply house. They'll put that in their machine and come with a color matchup that's as close as humanly possible to that uh, red that they use on the Xenon. And then we'll have him mix up, up a pint, and we're going to have to be touching up a Xenon playfield in the next film on a new old stock playfield that got damaged. But for now, for this particular application, these markers are just fine. I've gone ahead and already installed this top half up and through here. This has been put down. You don't cut out for the saucer, you merely trim that out later on. That would be for any hole that's in a play field. You don't bother trying to cut those out. And that's what the template looks like. And you would simply take this, turn it upside down on your sheet of mylar, which we get from uh, Wyco, and uh, cut out your template. And then you put the actual finished mylar piece down there with the paper still on it. Do your final trimming on it so it fits really nice and then go ahead and put it on. A small piece like this here is fairly simple to handle. The larger one that we're going to put on, this one right here, is a little uh, different story. Let me get the actual mylar and I'll show you. Now, here it is, all been cut out and trimmed. It's ready to be put on. Now, 
what we do is we take this, you can see the seam across here that cut. The paper has been peeled back and cut and then laid back down again just like you were going to install a piece of wallpaper. Now we'll get this template about where she belongs laid down where it wants and to keep it from moving we're going to take pieces of tape and hold down this section right here. All right. Now that'll hold that thing pretty much where we want it. Now we're going to pick this other end up here. It wants to catch on the flippers and a few other things because we've got it pretty close. We're going to slowly walk it back until we come to the section where it's peeled. Now we're just going to walk that thing right out of there, just like that, and you rub that mylar plastic back and forth underneath as you get ready to peel this paper back. If you do it real slow and real careful, that will lay down perfectly. I assume, of course, that you've gone ahead and cleaned this surface as best you possibly can. You've got all the dust and dirt and everything picked up off the play field so that you aren't just laying this thing down on top of all the dirt. And she will fall right down into place just as smooth as you'd want. And there. Take that little template piece off. Now we just push the flippers back out of the way so she can drop down underneath them. And there's half of it right there. No air bubbles. Nice and smooth. We use the thin sheet of mylar. It comes in two different thicknesses. I don't care for the thick one because the ball catches on it. It is easier to install because it lays down like a piece of plywood, but it, uh, it just doesn't follow the grooves and indentations and cracks and all the rest of the stuff that you come across uh, on the uh, average play field. Now we're going to go ahead and push down the top half. Now no matter what, how big a sheet, we still cut the thing in half and sometimes three sections depending on how hot it is. And that's how we go ahead and put down a mylar with no sticking, no bubbles, no mess. Now we'll go back with later on with an X-Acto knife and cut it around where it has to be. You don't want the mylar hung up on any post. You, don't, you want to rub all the air bubbles out of it. Push them over to the corner and get them out. And that will stick on there just as nice as you'd want. And it makes the surface really smooth for the ball and it protects it. Uh, if we were doing a new old stock playfield transfer we would make up a complete mylar that covers the entire length from top to bottom wherever the ball rolls. It would go in through here, go around just about every place that the ball travels so you'll have a perfect protection for the playfield and it'll last an awful long time. All right, we're going to get off of this and come back for a couple other things after we've gone ahead and uh, trimmed up that mylar. We'll come back and do a little more work on the top of the play field, and then we're going to flip it over and show you what we've done on the bottom. This is just about cover the rest of the top of the play field. I'm just showing you some of the basic stuff that we use here. We use this heat gun to pull up the old mylar that was on there. It had some pieces the guy had made up up around these things here trying to protect this heavy wear area. Well, we use a heat gun to peel the stuff up that leaves the glue on the play field. So after you've used your heat gun real carefully, you'll do a lot less damage to the play field if you let the glue stay on the play field and just simply pull up, pick up the plastic. Then we use this RC88. We'll tell you where to get all this stuff, of course. This is about six bucks a can, so you use it sparingly. You soak a rag, and you soak the area that the uh, glue has been on. It was up in through this area here. And this stuff uh, has a chemical reaction to the glue, and it just makes it bubble up, and then you can peel it right off of there. Uh, if you were doing a complete mylar pickup and cleanup, you've got quite a bit of work to do, because you can only do about a uh, six or eight uh, inch area at a time to keep control of what you're doing. But uh, when you you're done, it uh, not only takes all of the glue up, but it makes the paint really shine. This will not knock the luster off the paint and it won't hurt any painted surfaces. This happens to be a rubber cleaner for pinball games made by the Wildcat Company, but for some reason or other, the mixture that's in here, we've never been able to find out what it is, is perfect for removing the glue up after you've pulled the mylar up. Another thing that we use is uh, inexpensive rubbing alcohol from the local drugstore. What we use this for is the plastics. If you've got some real dirty plastic that are smoked up bad or got some 
chemicals or something spilt on them, this will clean all of your plastics for the top of the play field without injuring the uh, silk screening on the front of the back. It's really inexpensive to use. We saved the RC88 for just picking up uh, the glue off of the play field. We don't even clean the rubber with that stuff. Now, here's the Wildcat finish. Of course, everybody's familiar with this stuff. This is from the same company that makes the RC88. And uh, this is good stuff for doing the part of the play field that we didn't mylar, because you can't wax this before you put the mylar down. The mylar has a tendency not to want to stick on top of wax. So all you can use the RC88 and clean it off with a dry rag and vacuum it so there's no dust or anything. Now, I'm going to go over this thing before we finish up and I'll do the entire surface with this including the part that we mylar and the ball is really going to fly on this play field. And of course the old trusty uh, X-Acto blade here for trimming out where the mylar is stuck in underneath there. We trim around every one of these posts. You don't want anything holding this mylar from laying down perfectly flat. If it lays up against this post here or if you were to put it underneath the post and screw it back down, it will squeeze the adhesive off of the mylar and you'll end up with an air bubble that will start traveling right across and, and you'll lose the adhesion. You've got to have this thing laying perfectly flat uh, without any kind of um, dirt or anything underneath it. Okay, now what we're going to do is flip the play field over and show you all of the work that we did on the uh, mechanical parts of the game. and. Uh, Get caught up with that. All right, we're going to shot here of the flipper assembly switch we rebuilt. And here's what happens with these tired old suckers. Here's the original core plug. You can see by looking at the edge and the center of that, that that's been ball peened pretty bad. It's got a ridge all the way around here and this piece here has been hammering on that for the last eight or nine years and this is going to lip around the surface of it here which means it's going to hang up inside the tube. This plastic uh, Bakelite piece right here is worn so there's half of the power of the flipper right there. The other half's right here. That and the hanging up in the tube of this flared piece here, it's going to make that thing work pretty bad. So our cure is quite simple but takes a few bucks for parts. First thing we do is we eliminate the very small screws that they use, the 832, that's 8 wire size, 32 threads to an inch, that held this original coil stop on there. What we do is we drill this out 1164 this Bally has gone ahead and done this in the, in the later games towards the end, so it's not anything ingenious that we come up with. And we use a late Bally coil plug. Now these are made up of a little bit of material than the early ones. They've got a real nice radius here in the corner, which means they can't break, won't break. And you can see that there's also a radius to that edge right there, so it means that they got this set up so it'll take an awful lot of bangs before she'll peen that end over. And now we mount that down there with some 832 screws. We sometimes use uh, socket heads. These happen to be some aircraft fasteners we came across at a surplus house. Get them wires up out of the way. And uh, when you're running a couple of 1032 screws down in there, after you've tapped it, you can buy an inexpensive tap like this right here from a hardware store. That's about four bucks, five bucks. Once you've drilled your 1164 hole, you can hand tap that right down through by hand. You don't need a special machine or anything. And it will really sock this flipper in solid. She's not going to move after you get through doing this. Because that's what happened with these. These old screws used to shear off, and the guys would throw a screw in, run it all the way into the play field, or try any number of tricks to get this coil stop to keep from shearing off. Because there was just too much power, and they simply just break them off. So we just go ahead and put the next larger size in there. And while we're at it, we've gone ahead and put a new Bakelite piece on the old shaft. We'll take the old shaft and use a grinder and put a chamfer edge on that just like you saw on the coil stop. We make the edge of that piece look like this right here. So it'll take an awful lot of peening before you'll ever get that thing to mushroom because you don't want this to hang up inside the tube. Then we'll use some emery paper on it and shine it up real good. Now we take all the slop out of this here. Then we put a piece of uh, heat shrink tubing from Radio Shack on over this because you don't want this thing banging metal to metal on the end of stroke switch. 
Now, as far as the end of stroke switch is concerned, we don't use the belly. We use the one-piece molded one that they sell for the Williams. This is tungsten steel, and this is really rugged stuff, and this will take a hell of a beating. So we just don't use the early one with the fish paper that Bally had for this particular one. This thing is not indestructible, but it'll take a lot more of a beating than the original. So now you can see, after we've done all of that, we've tightened up everything that's on there, taken all the slop out of it, haven't done anything that the parts weren't readily available for, no special machining or tooling or anything, and this thing will perform unbelievable. It'll have every bit as much power, if not more, than what it had originally. If you want to play around with the coils, they've got some new numbers out for some of the later model Bally games where they had to send a ball up a ramp or something. And you can put a real heavy, uh, not heavy, it's actually a, a smaller winding but a heavier wire gauge in there, which will really pull this sucker in. But you're just going to shorten the life of everything else around it, including all the plastics on the play field. You'll start breaking them up. I just wanted to show you this here. This is typical of what I see in these games when I bring these things in there. This is the wiring that was in this thing. Absolutely beautiful, isn't it? Now this thing had shorts built into it like you wouldn't believe. And they ran out of solder or whatever, and when they ran these wires over here to the end of stroke switch, they just had them hooked in there and no solder. So this thing shouldn't even have run. Now what we've done over here, you can see that we've added in a fuse. Well, these early games didn't have a fuse on the play field. We had to put two of them in, actually. One of them is way down the far end where the 43 volts comes in. We put a fuse in to prevent the coils from burning it out. This one is in down here for the flippers, and it also covers the out hole. There was no way around it because the right-hand flipper also goes to the out hole. So this one's don't okay. care. If we have a problem with one of these flippers, this one here will let go. If we have a problem with anything up on the play field, then the other one's going to let go. I want to show you some of the things that are a little bit different on this game, if I can get this thing scoped in over here, they, give me a second or two to get that focused in, they didn't use any caps on these switches on the early games. Now the reason behind the caps, Bally's reason for using it, that to settle down, alright, that's where it wants to be I guess. Uh, let me show you where they were. They used to use caps on stand-up switches across the two points. Well, we didn't bother putting them on this game here because it isn't wired up for it. They got an insulator on here and it would have been a lot of extra work. But the purpose behind the cap, anytime you see a cap on a Bally pinball game, is to get a longer reading on a switch closure. The ball hits this thing so hard and so fast it doesn't always register. The computer is looking for a valid closure, so it wants to read a closure for so many zero crossings, but make sure that it is in effect a valid closure and not just a glitch in the program. So because of that they had to come around and add caps on most of the stand-up targets, most of the rollover targets, not a spinner because there's plenty of uh, uh, contact on the points on a spinner, but you'll find them on rollovers, you'll find them on stand-ups, and you'll find them on the thumper bumpers. They don't have them on this place anywhere on this game here. They hadn't got around to use them, but someone did stick one on the out hole because they were trying to get the computer to make sure it didn't miss that balling in the out hole. Of course, that didn't cure the problem. But So basically, we've gone ahead and fixed everything that we had to fix. We've got everything adjusted the way we want it down here on the play field. Uh, the tricky part is, of course, these contacts here on the bottom of this drop target, which aren't the best, because if they aren't adjusted exactly right, first of all, the drop target comes down and it doesn't make contact, or it makes contact and bounces, and you'll see the thing just scroll like crazy. These are kind of critical on adjustment. And so are the thumper bumpers. They have to be an, uh, enough initial contact to make sure that the computer reads it, but it also has to uh, let the ball roll far enough onto the apron so when the ring comes down and gives it a shot, that it'll get some kind of action out of it. So we've gone ahead and done all of that. we replaced a lot of the bulbs. We've got all of the lamps working on this thing now. Now what we're going to show you in the next phase is uh, a little bit of ball play and uh, show you how all of this work uh, came to an end here. Okay, here we are finally, and uh, we get this thing working pretty good. Still got a few glitches in it, but for the most part, it's starting to come around. These things take a little play. They like to be uh, used a little for the electronics that come around, especially the switches. But it's playing pretty good. All in all, we spent about uh, 26 hours on this thing. 
and uh, that's probably a lot longer than we usually do. But because of the interruptions with the back and forth with the filming and everything, we didn't have much choice. And uh, it's coming out nice. So now we're going to put this thing in a, somebody's cellar, and hopefully they'll enjoy this thing for quite a few years to come. And uh, that's basically the reason behind all of this work. Okay, well, why don't we uh, shut this thing down and we'll get on to our next project. What we're going to Well, there's no way to start with the Williams without lots of books and uh, illustrations and stuff because they can be a little confusing. What I've got uh, set up right here now hooked up to a switching regulator which came out of a video game supplying me with uh, 5 volts and 12 volts I power these boards up out of the game to test them hook them up to a driver board and uh, simply turn them on you can see the uh, flash come up on this comes up once and goes out put it in test mode flashes twice and it goes out that's about the only indication you're going to get out of this as far as self-test is concerned. There's a combination on those two LEDs up there that will give you some kind of troubleshooting. But usually when these lock up, they lock up good. Um, let me just show you the different systems they've had over the years. Down here, we have what they call Level 3. Now, I've only seen this in a couple of games, a Hot Tip and a Lucky 7, some of the very, very first games. Uh, you can spot them by looking underneath the battery. You'll see a bunch of traces in through there where in the future they were planning on putting a socket in. Well, that's where we go over here to level four. Level four, you'll find the batteries in the same places in level three. And now they have the outline of a socket, but they haven't put it in yet. This is early level four. This looks like World Cup and Contact I've seen this in. You can probably switch them around with jumpers and stuff, but this is just from memory having seen these games when they come out new and they were making revisions left and right level four some flash I remember seeing it in back to disco fever then level six some flashes later flashes level six to all the way up to alien poker I call this a six digit board uh, except for Alien Poker. They had a seven, they managed to get seven digits out of this board on Alien Poker. But for the most part, these are all six digit boards you see down here. When they went to level seven, they went to level seven digit. There's no connection between the level seven and the level seven digit. It just happens to be easier to remember that way. Now down here on the driver board, I've got this one marked early driver board because it has a row of resistors over here. We'll explain that in a while. They did away with them later on. And there's an early power supply. Now this covers everything up to just before Black Knight, so this covers quite a few of the earlier games. Over here, we have two different kinds of master boards. This is the one you want to stay away from. This one down here has probably got 60, 80 transistors in here doing what this one is doing with ICs. They ran out of ICs and so they made this board up here with a bunch of transistors. This is virtually impossible to troubleshoot. So I, if I find one of these things, I just go swap it out and get me one of these because this I can troubleshoot, this thing I can't come anywhere near figuring out. And this is your typical so-called slave display. All you have is a connector on the bottom and fed off of one of these right here for player one, two, three, four, and for your uh, credit and score display. All right, so what we've got laying here now is a level four. And what they've done is they've come up with a sort of a test on this. If this thing comes up with a variety of flashes or no flashes, you can see right here, get that thing, to, there we go. The bottom one on and the top one off indicates a ROM or PROM failure, which is very common on these early ones. The top one on, the bottom one off is a RAM failure. That's also common too. And more common than any of them is the two lights left on indicates a CMOS RAM, IC19. Now why they have so much problem with that circuit is fairly simple. What they are doing, find another board here, what they're doing is they're using dry cell batteries in a battery holder and this is where the memory protection is. This is what uh, 
keeps the memory after you've shut the game off. And the biggest problem with that is this holder. Now this one has been replaced. This is brand new. But when these get old and a little dirty, like this one right here, I don't know if you can catch that. You can see that green crud on the back of this one right here. A little penicillin. And you can see it on the inside also. This center battery here obviously isn't going to be making contact anymore. So this is due to come out of here and have a new board put in. This is the biggest problem with the Williams games, even on a brand new one. What happens is the battery is held in so tight with these clips that it can sit in there being held with these clips and yet still not make contact with either one of these two ends. It'll make contact with one and not the other. These things have to have new batteries inserted in and immediately go do a voltmeter check on them. That's what we're going to get set up to do next, to explain why there is so much problem with this particular circuit right here. So as we uh, progress down the line, you'll find that these problems stayed with this system even up until the new games. Okay, we're back. Now what I've got set up here is a VOM. What I'm interested in is that battery case over there with those three dry cells in it. As soon as you shut the game down, these three batteries over here are going to supply the CMOS RAM with approximately three and a half, hopefully four to five volts. Below three, you're going to run into trouble with it, so that's why the readings are important. What I do is I take the this bottom lead right here is connected to the inside battery which is connected to the ground bus along the side. So this first battery right here, you can see my meter, I got a one and a half volts there. Go to the lead of the next one, these are in series just like this here, they wind just like you had one right behind the other. The next one should read obviously a little better than three if I can stay still long enough. And this one over here should read four to five. So four and a half is good. Now, if there's something wrong with the circuitry between this contact here and the CMOS, then that battery isn't getting to the CMOS. So you go to pin 22 on your CMOS, which is the one opposite the number one pin, and you put your lead on there carefully, and there you got 530. Oh. So that circuit is good. That's why you're able to get this to start up. If for any reason the circuit goes bad and this CMOS RAM isn't being fed, she's going to come up as in bookkeeping mode telling you that the batteries are low or the batteries are bad and you simply will not get the game to start without replacing the batteries. But what I'm going to do now is see if I can come a close up on the uh, what a new battery circuit looks like. What we're doing here is showing you a typical piece that you get from Supply House. Now this is all nice fresh and new so this is going to work real good when you get it on the board but again I got to caution you that there was so much damn pressure with these clips right here holding that battery in you'll shove one end of the battery in and then drop the other end in and this end down here these clips could be holding that from making contact here so I always take these things and give them a little squeeze after I put the battery in to make sure that they're making contacts on the ends I just got a brand new game in here not too long ago and this was a problem in the brand new game it kept coming up bookkeeping mode and the reason behind it was, even though everything was brand new in the game, new board, new system, new everything, one of these clips was not making contact. Didn't happen every single time you turn the game on, about like two or three out of every ten, but enough to cause a problem with that circuit. Okay, now what we're going to attempt to do now is uh, show you common problems that we have found in most of these early Williams systems, and we'll get set up for that. All right, here we are. It's this connector right here that you're going to find is the biggest problem on any of the early Williams boards. They finally did away with this when they went to uh, level 8 and level 9. Level 8 you won't find in very many games, but level 9 is space shuttle on up. The main reason for coming out with a single board system is this connector right here. Now, I haven't seen the back of this one go too often, but it doesn't hurt to check it if you're going to go ahead and do this whole routine. So we'll discuss that problem first. It's this board here, 
and this row of uh, pins up here that gives you the problem. Now you notice I got this one ma marked here, blanking circuit out hole pulls in the startup. This one here we're having some problems with and I haven't got around to changing this connector yet but I bet you when I do it will cure that problem. This board is talking to this board down here and any one of these pins, some are more critical than others, is going to give you major problems. Interruptions, uh, shutdowns, uh, all of the coils pulling in on startup, major, major problems. And you can really lock one of these games up so bad. I got a Black Knight here that I got for parts. Every single coil is burned in the game because this is the board I think that was in it. It locked up and before the fuse would blow, it just went right down the line and took out every one of the coils. The problem is that these little connectors, which are a pain in the neck to change, but the biggest pain is finding them. I haven't found a supply house with them yet, and they seem to be kind of unique to this particular board. There are five of them with eight pins, 40 in total. You've got to get behind here and take the solder out of this entire row across here, either with solder wick or a, or a solder sucker or something that's going to take that heavy layer of solder out. They're only soldered on one side, and then you've got to put the new set in, get them all lined up, and tape them down to the top here so they're nice and secure. All of that for maybe one pin in this one and one pin in this one that is bad. But if you just change that one and not this one and the one down here and you think you got it, this one will go on you next time. There's no sense in doing one or two. You've got to do that whole row. Then you'll find that that's going to cure a lot of the problems. Now, how you can tell that's what it is, what I used to do is I used to get this in the game and go in behind and pull out on it a tiny bit and slide the pins back and forth until I found a position, shut the game off, turn it back on again, and if the game started and ran, then I knew it was this connector. That's one of the biggest problems with this early system. It's correctable, but it's a common problem, especially if those boards were put in and out a lot. The next common problem is right down here, these sockets. I've replaced two or three on this board to get it to run, but these sockets are getting old and tired, and there are so many of them. Um, Bally, you can usually get away with changing one or two on the top. You have to change every single one that has a ROM or RAM in it in this board to get this game to run. That could mean as many as uh, six to have to be changed. That can really run into some time, but you've got no choice because that's the main problem you have with it between the battery circuit, battery memory circuit, that connector down below on the other board, and these sockets right here. That's most of your problems with a Williams game. Let's get set up with something else and come back. I stay right on the line here. Now we just got through looking at this level four board. For your purposes later on, you should try to zero in on the board that comes close to the one that was in the game you've got. If you've got a game that's got no board in it, you should find out whether it's a prototype game or a production game and find out as much information as you can because you may end up having to find the very right board to be able to put in that game. Uh, I know there's a jumper system for these early ones. I've never been able to figure it out or find it out or find it printed anywhere. I'm sure Williams could probably give you the information if you call them, but the point is if you've got a flash board out of a flash game, then you know that you're going to be able to get it to run. If you've got a set of flash ROMs and you're looking around for a game to put it in, you don't know if it was a level 6 flash or a level 4 flash, so it's best to try to find a complete and running board to eliminate your problems. Let me show you how you can figure out which board you're dealing with. Level 3 and 4 have the batteries over here vertically on the left. Okay? Never mind how many sockets are out on here. Just remember where the battery location is. That's how you can pin these things down. You go to level six, you'll find the batteries now on the right hand side. They took them off of the left, they put them on the right. And uh, that's easy distinction to remember. Now, so the level three and four, the batteries over here on this side. Level 6, I don't know what ever happened to level 5, I guess there wasn't one. Level 6 is over here. Now let's move on up to level 7, which covers a lot more games. Level 7's cover from uh, Black Knight, Jungle Lord, Pharaoh, Solar Fire, Cosmic Gunfighter, oh wait a minute, yeah, Hyper, Hyper Ball 2, Defender, Warlock, Joust, Time Fantasy, Firepower 2, 
Starlight, Pennant Fever, all the way up to Laser Q. So it covers quite a few games. There's probably more of those out there than any other. So here's your level 7. Right here. Now we're back with the battery on the left again, but now they're horizontal. Here on the left. Now they stayed with this system with very minor changes all the way up until the very end. Now this one has an LED for test purposes right over there. I think I can get this one to fire up. Yeah, it gives you a fast zero and then out. And if you press this test button, it gives you the same response. It lets you know that the board is good. Now, other than the position of the batteries on this thing here, um, you got pretty much the same layout as you had on level six. They got um, more game ROM availability on this. They got a little better system on some other things, a little better memory protect, but basically it's the same unit. I think these are interchangeable all the way back to the, to the older games that I've never been able to figure out how to do it. I think it takes some special game ROMs. Now down here is how you can tell the early and late driver board. We talked before about resistors and no resistors. What they found out is they weren't reading the switches very well on these older boards. Because of this row of uh, resistors in through here which are in line with your switches in the play field, the switch matrix. So what they did was they told us to take all of these resistors out here, this row and this row, and put wire in there, just straight wire, zero, zero ohm resistors or wire to jump from. They found the switches read better and worked better without this resistor in line. So that's how you tell the early ones. If somebody has worked on it, uh, it might not be so easy to tell. But if you've got a genuine late model, very late model, then you're going to find that there aren't even, uh, there are some traces across here now. There isn't even, a, and these are all blanked out, there isn't even a place to put a wire resistor in there. They actually put a trace across there. So this is a very late board. This probably come out of a laser queue or something later on up the line as they made revisions. And one of the major problems you run across with this driver board is pretty dependable, pretty good. These transistors up here, these six transistors are the ones for the special coils on the play field. They're usually two slingshots and up to four thumper bumpers are run off of these right here. Any combination of that. Up to six. They figure they never need any more than six in a game and they haven't yet. If they got one more thumper bumper than usual, they go down and they drive it through the com program in the computer. But these are the ones, the special circuit. In the, if you held that switch closed on the thumper bumper, it stays in and it, as long as you hold your finger on that switch. It isn't a pulse circuit like the Bally where it just reads it and then slams it shut and opens it back up again, even though you're holding your finger on the switch. These will stay in. So anything that locks that switch up on the play field, like a, a crossed uh, a rubber ring that's uh, leaning up against it, will pull that in until either the coil fries, this transistor fries, or the fuse blows, depending on what goes first. So I've seen some of these boards with this thing burnt right out of here because the heat got back to here before the fuse blew. Someone either overfused it or something was wrong with the circuit. But you've got to understand that these six special ones, and that's the two slingshots and up to four thumper bumpers, are an entirely different circuit than anything else. Your outhole kickers and others are controlled by the computer, and they're run by other transistors on the board. These here, are the, you can exchange these with the same number as the Bally, or these are TIP-122s, or you can run the SE-9302s. Any number that was good for the Bally is good for these here. That circuit uh, has caused them some problems over the years because you've got to be careful about uh, uh, adjusting the switches too close or something in making that switch come on and stay on. But it gives so much better response on the action on the play field that that ball can sit up inside of three or four thumper bumpers and sit there and just play like hell for ten minutes. And this is the reason why, because this circuit isn't relying on a computer to reach a switch closure. It's actually a mechanical switch closure. And it just works great. Um, this, of course, is your relay for turning the flippers on. You got two PIAs here. You're doing two things with them. One is a switch matrix, bringing in switch information. And uh, the other one is for lamps. I believe we had three here. Yeah, 6821. We have three of them on here. You're doing lamps and you're doing switches with these PIAs. On the earlier boards, they had these PIAs, this is 6821, just like in the Bally game, 
They had them in sockets in the very early driver boards. Well, they rattled loose and uh, they were causing problems and so they simply soldered them directly into the board. That's great. You no longer have any rattle problems, but you've got one hell of a job taking these things out because they're soldered on both sides. This is tough to work on. you really got to practice good and long before you attempt something like this here or you'll just tear this board all up. Now we're going to uh, touch on a couple of other things. I think we'll get on to um, some power supplies next and show you the early and late power supply. They got by with two for covering quite a few span of years. Be right back. Alright, we're going to get into power supplies next, but I wanted to catch on this first. Um, this is in a laser cube book that uh, it's the last one that had this level 7 system. And it's one of the only ones I've ever found that has a complete listing of all of the 0 through 9 possible number combinations that can come up if you've got a problem on the level 7 board with that, that uh, LED that's on there. They're telling you that 0 flash on and goes out is a pass. If it remains on, down here in the bottom it says that there's 0 remaining on after power turn and it gets a board lock up. So that 0 should just flash for a second. One comes on and stays on and they're telling you the IC13, 2 is IC16, 3 is IC17, 4 is 17 also, 5 is 20, 6 is 14, a game ROM, 26, a game ROM, and 19, the most, is 8, is uh, IC19, the most common failure that they have. And 9 is simply telling you that the coin door is closed and the memory to protect circuit is faulty or the, again the CMOS RAM. Sometimes by opening the door and then trying to turn it off and turn it on again, what you're going to do is rewrite the uh, information into the, uh, the CMOS. It will start up. So sometimes you have to be patient with a Williams game. It's not like a Bally. Bally either comes on or doesn't come on. Williams you can coax it to come on sometimes. Come up in bookkeeping mode two or three times, and then that fourth time, she'll come up and run if you've opened up the front door. It's, n it's not a simple cut and dried thing. But again, when you see this 04 number show up, it's gone into the bookkeeping mode. It'll usually have a game identification number up there on one of the glass. Then you've got to sh make sure that the batteries are up fresh to make sure there isn't something wrong with that uh, memory protect uh, switch in the front door. Uh, you've got a bunch of things you've got to do before you start pulling that board out and uh, just assuming that it's bad. Seldom have I ever had to work on a Williams power supply. I've got to admit they're pretty reliable. I'm sure that there are parts that go on them, but I've never replaced a 5 volt regulator. I have replaced some of these caps here when I get an audio hum. And uh, sometimes I run across a fuse holder going bad, but for the most part, these, these early ones, as well as the late ones, these early ones are very reliable. What they don't have on here, and what they were getting ready to try out, they were going to put a relay on here to probably shut your uh, general illumination down for special effects and stuff, but I don't think they ever did on this board. What they did was they come out with another board, starting with somewhere in the middle of uh, Black Knight. I got this thing upside down, and this one they loaded this sucker up, and now you got a relay over here, and this has got nothing to do with your flippers. This is an IC to control. To, yeah, this is to control your GI, and the GI down here, as you can see from a typical board, is burnt. What happens is there isn't enough wires, aren't enough wires, to take the power for all of the uh, general illumination in the game. Too many bulbs, so I always come from behind here and hardwire this out and put a nice big fat. Molex connector on there about a six amper and do the same for this over here and just do away with this part of the thing this is the AC coming in and out in here and these things burn quite a bit so now you got a nice big fat bridge rectifier here got some nice caps on here some good uh, fuse fuse holders this is a very very reliable board here's your five volts yeah in here and uh, for the most part, this is pretty straightforward. We'll, we'll take a look at the schematic for it later on and see if we find anything that I don't recall ever having too much problem with one of these. Um, one thing I have had a lot of problem with is uh, this is a sound speech board for Black Knight, I believe. Yep. Now, where you're running a problem here is you can sometimes pop one of these things here and get, end up with garbled speech or part of the speech missing and these are expensive they can run thirty dollars a piece times four 
It's 120 bucks. So we place this section right in here unless you can find a game to scrap out. I find it easier to find a game to scrap out. What's nice about this unit is this. You can put 18 volts AC up on here with a center tap transformer you can get from Radio Shack and you can power this board up independently out of the game and do all of the tests and all of the running of the voltages and everything that you need to do on this independently out of the game. Very simple transformer hookup. 18 volts going in, center tap, ground on the center, 18 on one end, 18 on, on, on the other end and this board will fire up independently. It has its own processor own everything. It's completely independent of the game. All it's looking for is information coming up here for solenoid closures to determine what sound to make or what speech program to do or whatever. This is a very nice unit to uh, troubleshoot because you can take it out and set it on the bench and just take your time with it. Now let's see if we can look at uh, some schematics we got here. Because the one thing that Williams does well is publish uh, their schematics. These are some muskets from uh, Williams. You've got to find these someplace because these are really invaluable. Here's one here. When they were making the transition between level 7 and level 8, they're showing you uh, almost a comparison between the two systems. And it's a nice set of drawings covering the early and the late system. It's the early system here. Uh, I want to mention on this board down here below. This is the result of, uh, this is a flipper board here. This is how they regulate the uh, 50 volts. Take AC, make it into DC for your flippers. It's a separate circuit because it's 50 volts. All the other coils in the game, at least this game, are 28 volts. So they wanted a special circuit so they could pump the flippers up to 50 volts. So they use a special winding on the transformer. Now this board didn't originate in this game as a flipper game. This is out of Hyperball. And they were using this to control the motor or some other... Thing, and they adapted it down. That's why there's this big board here and there's only one or two little items on it because they left a lot of the other items off that they were using to control the motor. And this ended up being a flipper board. It's very easy to troubleshoot. That's the power supply I just sold you a little while ago. They were making a transition to here and I'll tell you these they could have a row of uh, uh, fuses underneath here, in addition to these here, there's liable to be fuses all over the place and these things aren't always accurate. So whenever I get a new game in, I look, physically look inside and find out, yes, is this fuse being used or maybe it isn't being used in this game. Maybe they haven't made that change yet. The books don't always match the game. So take a little time when you get a game in and make notations whenever these things don't match up to what actually is in the game. Here's your typical system, level 7. The CPU, driver board, speech, soundboard, power supply, and of course this addition down here. This came out with Firepower 2 is when they went to a 50 volt flipper system. And they made many many changes in that flipper system between then and the final uh, when they finally gave up on it and changed the system entirely. Now this is what I like about the Williams schematics. This is a segmented picture of your CPU and I'm telling you there isn't anything that you can't troubleshoot with this, this schematic. This is absolutely beautiful. If Bally had done this years ago it would have been a lot easier to find out what was going on. But this thing has got it broken down into sections. You've got power, power on reset, blanking circuit. You've got everything blocked off here so if you're going to go troubleshoot the, the address decoder and memory protect circuits, you can look for it. It's right in here. It only covers these certain chips. You don't have to fly all over the CPU looking for it. The address drivers are listed out here. The MPU, the clock to it, the test points. This is really great. Combine this, combined with the engineer's information over here, you can do an awful lot of work on it. You can do a lot more work on one of these Williams boards as far as troubleshooters are concerned in the Valley. They give you all the information you need. And they can repeat it again for the solenoid driver board here. This is absolutely beautiful. This is foolproof. Anybody can work on a board with this much information. Now, what we're going to touch on now is uh, the transition that they made from this system on up to the later ones and uh, we're just going to show you a couple of pictures of what they were getting into and, and the changes they were starting to make.
All right, they were making a transition at this time. This book, as I said, covers level seven and eight. Eight was only used, as far as I know, in Pennant Fever, I think it was called, a baseball game. Then they went directly to level nine. But this will give you an idea, that they're very much similar. This will give you an idea that things sat in there like so. Now we've got everything on one board. And they began to get their act together. This is really nice. This is a much better system than the earlier one. And they used almost identical power supply. They made some minor changes, but they stayed with basically the same power supply. But now they're starting to get less and less of attachments or extras and stuff on this board here. They were starting to put some of it back on the CPU and then eventually they get into level 9 and this book here is something you've really got to get a hold of. This is one of the best books ever. I use a lot of the information out of this book to double check all the way back to level 4, 6, and 7 and of course 9. This is designed for 9 but a great many of the things that are in here they do a lot of theory up here in front. The troubleshooting stuff that they have in here actually is good in, for the most part uh, all the way back to the earlier games. A lot of the troubleshooting stuff. I've, I've discovered a great deal of information in here that I could use on an earlier game. They have changed some of the uh, components. Of course they got 50 volt uh, flippers in there now and they got a little different power supply but the theory behind here is almost identical they're still driving lamps the same way they're still doing switch matrices the same way they're still doing a lot of things the same way they're still driving coils the same way so this information is good even for the older games and uh, they do a lot on displays in here and then with the really nice part about this thing here is in the back they have a troubleshooting part and they also show you the difference between level 7 and level 9 what the chip is called in one game and what it's called in another game how much change they made whether the pinout is different this is just a great great book to get a hold of so if you can find this pinball book and this one here and they'll give you a lot more information than Bally does in theirs they almost want you to uh, get in there and do some checking on that board. They're not the least bit afraid of giving you the information you need. So now we're going to go ahead and uh, touch on a couple of other subjects here after we get set up. Okay, you can't leave Williams without discussing flippers because they've made more strides in flippers than the other companies have, but not without some cost. Here's the first 50 volt flipper that they had, 50 volt coil. You'll notice it's only got a single diode across the back. What they've got inside of there is one continuous winding heavy wire connected to a winding thin wire. One continuous winding. That's why there's only one diode on here. You only need one if you only got one winding. These diodes used to break off and then you would have all kinds of shutdown problems and tilt problems and all kinds of spike problems inside the game. So for lots of reasons they went away from this design. That was one of the reasons why. This is about what they ended up with. This is pretty close to what they got right now. I'll explain what you got on here. You got a double diode just like the Bally flipper now. You have two separate windings inside there. And you got a heavy winding and light winding just like every flipper coil has. And the heavy winding pulls the coil in then your end of stroke switch opens up and the soft winding, the light winding, takes over to hold it in. So that system hasn't evolved that much uh, because it was already in existence in other companies' games. But what they've done here is they've greatly improved things like a spiral spring, which when, fl when closed up will uh, flatten right out so it won't break. They've come out with better and better links in through here, much more rugged uh, hardware in and around this thing. The weakest part of this right here is how many times you tighten this thing up. Eventually she'll crack across here, but not that bad. This bell crank system right here is extremely rugged. So these flippers have really evolved. The thing that they made the biggest changes in is this bracket back here. When they first came out with a 50 volt, these things were breaking off and shearing off, and they tried all kinds of things. So how they solved it was, you can see the curve and the radius of that curve of that bend right there. That allows that bracket to move a tiny bit 
if necessary. If you make a tight right hand turn right there, it allows that crease across there to bend back and forth and these were shearing off on the first uh, 50 volt games. Now you've got a nice heavy set of Allen head screws going into a boss built into the bottom. I mean this is really a nice piece of engineering. This is one really strong unit. This suppressor that's on right here is on here for one reason. For the European games, I've had it on there for years and years. If you recall what an old ignition system looked like in the old days, when you had a set of points inside there that were open and closing to collapse the field in a coil to get your high voltage for your spark plugs, they always had a capacitor in there. And it was in there for one reason, to keep these points clean down here when these open and close because there's a tremendous power surge inside this coil so these things used to arc across if you put one of these on here and it's and it's and it's uh, held on there really nice so it won't go flying off on your brake then those points will stay remarkably clean for a very long time the disadvantage to this system is that if this shorts out it acts like you don't have an end of stroke switch anymore it acts like it's a continuous wire and you can pull that flipper in and fry that coil it doesn't happen that often because these are fairly expensive and, and a nice uh, rated capacitor. So these are doing the job. The early ones were breaking off. They had them laying down here. They had them hanging off the back. They had them hanging off with a, a wire down to the play field. They had them all over the place until they finally settled on this. But it required them to redesign the whole thing and put a bigger bracket on here to support this. So they got their act together with this thing. Now here's one thing they finally stopped doing. They had an end of stroke switch here hitting uh, an actuator which then changed the lane change switch and you know that if you went in there to do just that with an adjusting tool that you're going to come over there and put 50 volts on that damn switch line and cook half the damn chips on the board so finally they put this over on the cabinet on the flipper switch and finally they get even smarter and they now have it in circuit so it senses a uh... exactly how they work it but it's uh... They senses the flipper being all the way in, which then tells the computer that this flipper is all the way in, which then tells the computer that this switch is closed or there is no switch, but that uh, I think they're working on an amperage or a voltage drop or something like that. But now they can tell when that flipper is pulled in, which does the same thing with a lane change. They no longer have any switches in circuit, and that really have solved an awful lot of problems. This is one extremely rugged unit, one of the best features on any new game. And if you don't keep this thing up to par, you're kidding yourself, because this is 99% of any pinball game, and especially a Williams pinball game. I put those units in whenever I come across... Uh, an older game that has this 50 volt single one in here. I throw all this stuff away. I go in there and I put the latest linkage in there. The latest this, the latest uh, 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 the latest uh, bushing in here. The latest everything I can possibly install in here, including this coil. And it just makes the older games work that much better. Okay, let's find something else. Alright, I think this needs a little explanation. You're going to find this particular circuit only on a Williams game. So I'm going to see if I can explain to you why. This is a slingshot switch off a Williams game. And they have on here a small capacitor and uh, a resistor. And what that is called is an RC network. They call it a filter. I call it an RC network. This lug over here is dead. You're simply connecting this capacitor with the f resistor in circuit and this does the same thing as that small capacitor did on the other, on the early valley games and if you've got a slingshot that suddenly gets sluggish on you and doesn't seem to respond like it is it still kicks it'll still work but without this in circuit across here it doesn't build up a charge and it doesn't uh, kick as heavy so you go inside and you take a look see and you're going to see a broken lead off of here or possibly a broken lead on this end and you'll have to resolder the circuit back in there. But simply put, this is just in series with this. One is in front of the other and you have to observe polarity. Now that's on a slingshot switch. They're doing the same thing on the jet bumpers or thumper bumpers but they're doing it more complicated <coughs> in that you have to putting all a lot of extra lugs on here. Everything's been cleaned off of this one here, but two of these lugs would have the resistor, capacitor, and then the wires going in, and then the extra set of switches is strictly for sound. This top set of switches closes the circuit. As long as you hold that down, that jet bumper pulls in. The yoke 
drops down and allows these two to come together to make the sounds. So they're using two separate sets of switches. This is held open by the yoke on the bottom of the jet bumper. She comes slamming down, you got a sound. So if this thing breaks off, the thumper bumper is going to work all right because the top half's okay, but the bottom half, you won't get a sound out of it. Now I think uh, we're going to just wrap this thing up now. I'll make a few notes here and get a little bit of what we've missed up until now and put it all together. So we're getting near the end of this. I want to leave some time to do some reviewing of some uh, Williams games. Okay, what we got here is a book with the flyers in it, 1977 up until present. And we're just going to touch on each one of these games. This is uh, one of the very first ones that Williams came out with called Hot Tip. Yeah, the first electronic pin ball they made. Next was followed by uh, Lucky Seven. They're all standing around here wondering why the game just locked up. Then you got World Cup, which really wasn't that bad a game, 1978. They're having their troubles with the system though when it first came out. It wasn't that smooth takeoff and, and uh, not as good as Bally was it to start with. Here's a wide body contact. Followed by uh, Disco Fever, takeoff on a movie theme. And uh, Phoenix. These games all have electronic sounds in them. They started right out with electronic sounds. They knew it was better right from the beginning. Over here we got Pocorino, wide body. Another shot of Phoenix. And then Flash, a really hot game that Williams had in 1979. This one was an extremely popular game. I believe Steve Ritchie had a piece of this one. And a wide body version of the same thing called Stellar Wars. Not, not as good. It played a little soft. This was a big major disappointment, a game called Trizone. It just didn't seem to be better than the ones. They were seem to be getting a little better each time, and then they fell back on this thing. Here we have one called, uh, turn it for you, Time Warp. They didn't make very many of these, but it was an interesting little game. It had uh, five thumper bumpers, curved flippers. They were trying all kinds of stuff. Laser Ball, wide body, made in 1979. And the first talking game of the industry, which was Gorga, 1979. The game came with a little plastic 33 and a third record where you could hear him talk. It was strictly computer voice back then though, nothing just distinctive like uh, Williams had. And a really, really great game called uh, uh, Firepower, the original Firepower. Uh, three ball, multi ball, speech, a very fast game and a very good game. That was a Steve Ritchie game. Alien Poker, the first seven digit game. And the last of the level sixes, and an interesting little card game. Not bad at all. And, uh, of course, the original Black Knight. This was tremendously popular. They produced this game for a long time, and it, uh, it proved to be an outstanding winner for them. However, they came out with another two level. This one called Jungle Lord, shortly after one called Pharaoh that weren't very good games because they thought that the two level play field was the concept the player was looking for and it was but it had to be as good as Black Knight or they weren't going to play it so towards the end over here this last one called Solar Fire they were going into their econo phase so they cut out a speech and I'm not even sure this was multi-ball so this was a real disappointment and not a very good two level game now as the real econo game started in 1981 with Barracora very plain Jane game, as you can see from the play field here. No speech. They uh, came back again, see Richie did with this hyperball, and they thought perhaps the player was looking for something in a pinball cabinet that was a gun game, but it proved to be a major disappointment and a very, very expensive game to produce. Gunfight, another Econo game. Came out in 1982. Not uh, too successful. Warlock was a remake, a limited production remake of uh, Blackout. And uh, Defender next to it is a very limited production two-player game with the uh, video game theme. Again, the video game theme. This one called Joust, a stand-up opposite two-player. Other than the novelty factor, it really wasn't very good. Then we have Time Fantasy, which was an extremely dull game. Made in 1983, another plain game. So let's, uh, let's pump it up. We'll bring back Firepower and call it Firepower 2, but they took out the speech cut back one ball, it was a two ball multi ball, and as far as I'm concerned, they ruined the game. Starlight, just a lots of rollover buttons on the play field, and 
Not much of anything else going on, unfortunately. Laser Q was a little better because it was a remake of Alien Poker. But Laser Q was a pool game, Alien Poker was a card game, so it seemed as though they were just rehashing the old themes. Now we get into the heavyweight stuff. In 1985, they come out with Space Shuttle. One last final attempt at getting the player back, and this worked. This was multi-ball, speech, a nice light show, and just a great game with a whole new board system in it. Exceptionally nice game. Then came Sorcerer shortly after, two-ball, multi-ball, speech, nice playing game, still being sought after by people. So was Comet. They're starting to work their way down into the home market now, based on a carnival theme. High speed. Steve Ritchie's next attempt, and this was a great one. They produced a lot of these. This uh, was a very successful game out there, and an awful lot of fun. Great home game. Grand Lizards, just so-so. A good, adequate Williams game, but nothing exceptional. Road Kings was a disappointment in comparison, because they were on a winning theme for a while, and then they seemed to go backwards here. Then came Pinbot. What can I say? This thing was great out of the gate. It's great now. It's one of the best home games you can find, and it is just an all-around classic. And none better during this time period. Good example of the other way is Millionaire, which didn't prove to be too successful, and the players didn't care for it. Had a roulette wheel in the middle of it. Not too good. F14, Steve Ritchie's next game. He seemed to pump new life into the company about once a year. And this F-14 was a great game for them. They sold an awful lot of them. It makes a super, super home game. Great light show, great speech, full ball, multi-ball. An unusual piece was one called Fire. This was laid out like a small town. You had a building that appeared to be burning. It had uh, a special ch uh, champagne edition. And it had with brass rails and legs and etc. And uh, it was an interesting piece, interesting game. Big Guns is a uh, son of a disappointment as far as I'm concerned because they built the entire game around this catapult theme up in here and once you played that four or five times it seemed as though that was what the whole game was all about. Space Station, on the other hand, was uh, a very good game when it came out and uh, but they rolled right over it to make room for a super hype game called Cyclone. A Cyclone was a super game, and it still is. These are difficult to find. If you wanted one for yourself, you're not going to be able to readily find one because the operator is still using the game out there, and he's getting a lot of mileage out of it. There's no reason for him to want to sell it to you. So they're very, very hard to find. Now, this will introduce a new game designer to Williams, Pat Lawler, and this was his first game for Williams, Bonsai Run. I think it was a, a masterpiece of workmanship. This thing was an incredible, incredible game. Very limited production, a little on the expensive side. Swords of Fury, the follow-up game, was a disappointment in that it was just an adequate game, nothing special. Taxi has proven to be a real winner in the long run. It is interesting because it had two separate uh, female characters on the play field. The first one was called Marilyn with blonde hair, and then suddenly they stopped in the middle of the run and called her Lola and changed the color of her hair. There may have been a licensing conflict there. We don't know. Jokers, a card game. More than adequate. A nice little one. It's proven to have some legs out there, but not near as good as Pat Lawler's next game, Earthshaker. This is a phenomenal game. He seems to be able to come out with new concepts each and every time, not just rehashing the old stuff. These games are sensational. And here's another one I considered sensational when it came out, but like a lot of other uh, people, it uh, was disappointed to find out that the players didn't accept this game, and it was kind of a disappointment. But as far as the home market is concerned, this is one you should be looking for. Get it away from the operator as soon as possible so it's in nice condition. And this is a phenomenal sounding, phenomenal looking game and a great playing home game. Too complicated, I think, for the street player. Police Force is interesting only in that I think it was supposed to have been Batman originally, at least it was rumored to have been designed that way, and suddenly they did lots of licensing for whatever reason, and they came out with a bunch of cutesy animals on the play field, and it just simply didn't have the bite it could have had, or should have had, if it were Batman. The next game, other than the animated back glass, I see no reason for even mentioning this one. It just is not up to William standards. It was an okay piece, but look what's next. Whirlwind. For my money, and a lot of other people's, the best game made 
in the last 10 years and this thing has got everything. You've got three spinners, six thumper bumpers, incredible play field action, good sound package, good light package, a great game. Roller games, sort of a disappointment. Steve Ritchie's next game, for some reason or other, no one seemed to have any enthusiasm behind it, so it came and went in a hurry. It might have been a better game than it looks, but it was never given the chance to prove itself. Diner, an unusual game, a lot of novelty stuff on there, jukebox, a lot of other small stuff on the playfield. Interesting piece, but very much a novelty game. Uh, Riverboat Gambler. As far as I'm concerned, it was a very much of a disappointment because this seemed to be trying to get a poker machine lined up with a pinball machine lined up with a roulette game, and it was none of the above. And it didn't have much acceptance out there, so uh, it just seemed to come and go. But that's okay because it made room for Fun House. Now this is Pat Lawler's latest game and certainly one of the best ones put out in the last 10 or 15 years by anybody. This is a phenomenal piece of equipment. It has a new board system in it which allows a great deal of animation up here on the head. It has about everything you could possibly want on a play field. Incredibly well conceived and laid out. It's just a great, great game. Now over here we have Bride of Pinbot, the follow-up to the original Pinbot. This one's an interesting piece. It has a cube four-sided head in it and it uh, has a very nice light package, a nice speech package but it's too soon to tell whether or not this will have legs anywhere as new, near as good as the original. Now what we're going to touch on now is what we're going to do on the next tape. We'll touch on this, see if we can get you interested in our next project. This one here is going to be a Xenon. What we're going to do with this is take a Xenon game that's in really bad shape, take a new old stock play field, and combine the two. We're going to condense 40 or 50 hours of work down into four hours of tape, covering every single concept that we could possibly think of in uh, regarding this project. I think you think you're going to find this extremely interesting and uh, very informative. So that's it for this one now, and we'll see you next time around.